Hi, I'm Trey, and you're watching the very first episode of Game Changer, a series of videos where we'll take a look at game design in video games to see what we can bring over to our TTRPG tables. And today, prepare your camping gear and make sure your bunny hops are on point because we're going to take a look at first-person shooter maps. First of all, what are FPS maps trying to achieve? What is the kind of gameplay that they're trying to create? Well, first-person shooter is a genre with a lot of variety in it. You've got single-player games like Doom or Bioshock, you've got co-op shooters like Left 4 Dead or Borderlands, and there's also esports titles like Valorant or Counter-Strike. And every single one of these subgenres is going to have different design goals and a very different style of maps. The one thing holds true for pretty much all of the games I've just listed. People play those games for the combat. So the level design reflects that. The maps are designed to give you the most fun combat possible. So if you're planning a combat heavy session, FPS maps are going to be a useful source of inspiration. But it's important to note that that's not going to be every session. Sometimes you'll want the focus of your campaign to be on other things like investigation, puzzles, or intrigue, for example. But luckily, if you're interested in those other goals, you're in the right place. I'm going to talk about them in future episodes of Game Changer, so make sure you subscribe and click on my face whenever it pops up in your recommended videos. But back to FPS maps. How do they give us those fun combat encounters? Well, luckily, we have a pretty famous level design challenge that's made its round in game designer circles. And it outlines how FPS maps are made. This is the whiteboard test by Robert Yang. The idea is that when recruiting a level designer, you ask them to create an FPS multiplayer map and then explain how that map flows and what kind of gameplay it creates. And then Robert Yang gives us a bunch of axes to analyze how good that map is. At the beginner level, we find the kind of maps that you or I, mere mortals, would probably make. The kind of map that's more interested in having cool stuff to show rather than being fun to play in. At the intermediate level, we find the kind of maps that's probably the most common in tabletop RPGs. This boxy style of map that suffers from the room-hallway-room room syndrome, as Robert Yang puts it. What we start to see at the advanced level is what Robert Yang calls differentiation. To understand what differentiation is in level design, let's talk about what happens when there's none. In tabletop RPGs, this is something we typically find when we attempt to run a labyrinth. In a maze, the entire point is to get lost, and so we make every single intersection look exactly the same, and players are unable to tell one junction apart from the previous 10. But what happens when you actually try to run this is that players can't tell left apart from right, so they just end up picking one at random. Not exactly the most engaging gameplay. Tabletop RPGs are at their best when players make informed decisions, based either on what they think gives them the best chance, or maybe on their characters' personalities. And labyrinths are infamous for the fact that they very much do not lead themselves well to that kind of gameplay. In fact, this labyrinth map's creator, Tyson Logos, tells us, mazes as dungeons generally suck. That maze is absolutely something I would never use in an actual RPG session. Differentiation is how you avoid this phenomenon. It's all of the hints, big and small, hidden within the map that lets players make informed decisions about where they want to go next. And the whiteboard test lists a few ways professional level designers do it. It lists narrow versus open geometry, elevation changes, and then at the expert level, you have levels that tell a story in and of themselves. The most important thing to understand, in my opinion, is that in a shooter, you're usually not fighting people who are in the same room as you. You're fighting people in the next room over. In a tabletop RPG, people tend to design dungeons on a room-by-room -room basis. 
That's why in official modules, you usually see one subheader for each room. We add a room and then we try to make that interesting. There's even a challenge on social media right now called Dungeon 23, where you create a mega dungeon by creating one room every day for a year. But when you start thinking about combat taking place not within a room, but across two adjacent rooms, then what starts to happen is you start paying a lot more attention to the nature of the connections between those rooms. It's those doors, those archways, staircases, ledges, hallways, that frame how people use those maps. One of the most common FPS map layouts is to have three interconnected lanes that players can run down. And it's pretty interesting to take a look at different takes on this three lane map layout to see how each game differentiates between its three paths. Probably the most famous example of a three lane map is Dust 2 from Counter Strike. In Counter Strike, you have a. Uh, let's call them attackers because YouTube doesn't like that other word, and defenders. The defenders have to keep control over two sites called A and B, but as soon as the attackers capture either A or B, the rules change. Now the attackers have to defend the point they have just captured. They win if they can hold it for 45 seconds. Each site has two entry points for attackers one from their lane and one from the middle lane. The A site is very lopsided. You have this long open corridor called Long A, which favors long range snipers. And then this small twisty tunnel called Catwalk, which favors close quarter combat with twitch reflexes because an enemy can appear behind every single corner. But even more importantly, if you're defending A, you have the high ground and a good amount of cover from Long A, but you have a lot less cover from Catwalk. So the A site is pretty easy to attack, but once you capture it, you're going to have to defend a site that's pretty easy to attack. Meanwhile on B, the site is much easier to defend from both of its entry points. From one side you have a bunch of crates that can act as cover from the tunnel, and then if the attackers come from mid, you don't just have to look through the door, you also have that hole in the wall that players call the window. So capturing B is going to be a struggle, but if you succeed, it's going to be very difficult for the defenders to take it back. So with Dust 2, you can see how the level designer was able to differentiate the three lanes. You can go long A if you're a good sniper, you can go mid if you want to flank A and do some sneaky stuff, or you can go B if you're confident you can win a difficult fight. In RPG terms, one of these paths would be perfect for the party's ranger, for example, the second would be perfect for their rogue, and the third would be for a barbarian. You don't pick a lane at random anymore. Your choice has some meaning, and it's based on your personality and what you're good at. And as I said earlier, there's a lot more games that follow the three lane maps layout. And they each have small differences that have major effect on the gameplay. One franchise that has dozens of really cool examples of this is Call of Duty. The vast majority of Call of Duty maps follow a simple three lane system with a good amount of differentiation. But more importantly, Call of Duty maps are pretty much the smallest maps of the FPS genre. And that means those maps are at a scale that's similar to what we often use as battle maps in tabletop RPGs. For example, you've got Nuketown, a map that's made up of just two houses facing each other and some trucks in the middle. You have one short straight lane for people who want to be in the action as soon as possible, one long lane with a lot of cover that's slower and more methodical, and then a middle lane that splits in two. You've got elevated sniper's nests on each side, and then a twisty middle path with the trucks acting as very tall cover, so the snipers can shoot at people on the side lanes, but they have a hard time spotting people running down the middle. Then you've got Hijacked, a map on the yacht, which also lends itself very well to being turned into an RPG battle map. But you'll notice, even if this ship is pretty linear, 
the level designers have made sure to make the ship asymmetrical, so there would be a good amount of tactical differentiation between the different lanes. On one side you've got this sneaky catwalk behind the tub that lets you get pretty far into enemy territory without being spotted. On the other side you've got this roofed seating area, so people will see you cross and you'll probably have to fight them, but you'll have a good amount of cover to help you. And then the middle splits into three lanes vertically. Just like Nuketown, you've got balconies acting as snipers' nests, but then you've also got the center deck, a very open area at the center of the action, acting as a bit of a no man's land because of how dangerous and exposed it is. And then finally, you have the engine room, so you can sneak your way into the enemy territory and dislodge their sniper. So yeah, if you want maps that are easy to use as tabletop RPG battle maps, the Call of Duty franchise has a lot of good examples to pick from. In fact, if you scroll down to the video description, you'll find a link to a Tumblr called Grid Paper, which lists hundreds of maps from a bunch of different games. And hey, while you're down here, make sure to leave a like to help me get this new channel started. So far, we've seen a couple of ways you can differentiate different lanes of a battle map. You can toy with the geometry of a lane, breaking lines of sight with curves or bends, a lot of cover, maybe with elevation changes, if you want to promote close quarter combat. Or you can keep those lines of sight long if you want to favor ranged combat instead. Then you can have a lane with a lot of connections to other lanes for some high octane action. Or you can have a lane that's almost entirely isolated from the others for some sneaky shenanigans. And if you vary the types of lanes in your battle map, your players will naturally start making more tactical decisions, simply because they are given that choice. One last map I want to showcase is from a completely different game from the ones we've seen so far. The Presidential Plane from Rainbow Six Siege. As I said at the start, if you want to have a good amount of differentiation in your maps, then you need a bunch of different types of connections between the rooms of your map. And Rainbow Six Siege is a game that's pretty famous for how many new mechanics its maps have brought to the FPS genre. The map here is, if you squint really hard, also a three lane map, since it's split into three very linear levels. You've got the cargo bay at the bottom, then a level for passengers, and at the top you have a server room. But you don't have to use the doors in Rainbow Six, because every single wall and every floor comes in three flavors. You have standard walls and floors, but then you also have breakable walls and floors, which players can punch a new pathway into, and then you also have semi-breakable walls and floors, which can let projectiles through, but not people. Breakable walls are basically additional doors, it's just you blast them with a shotgun instead of actioning the door handle but players can still use them in interesting creative ways. For example, by punching tiny peeping holes into the wall, or by placing remote controlled charges on one side of the wall to hide them from people on the other side of that wall. Then you've got destructible floor hatches. You can jump down a hatch, but you can't climb up a hatch, unless you have one of those special abilities that's only in a few characters. So these act as a one-way only pathways, which adds a whole new layer to the tactics. Maybe you'll camp at the top of the hatch, knowing that enemies can't get to you easily and that you have the high ground. Or maybe you'll use the hatch as a way to flank your enemies while they're busy trying to breach through your defenses. And those are just a couple more tools in the toolbox. But we can add even more types of connections between rooms. In your typical fantasy setting, we can probably find places with murder holes that provide a lot of cover to people on one side of the wall, but none to the people on the other side. In the wilderness, we can have a pathway that's obscured by foliage, a waterfall, maybe some fog. So only people who know the area will know about those secret passages. Going back to the whiteboard test, what Robert Yang describes as the expert level of map making 
is to have the map itself tell us a story. In level design, this is usually called signposting because, well, the simplest way to do it is to add signs inside of your map. This way is the pharmacy, this way is the overseer's office. The idea being, you tell, or at least you foreshadow, what your player can expect if they pick one direction through clues in the environment. This could be anything. Noises of enemies echoing through the corridors, a trail of blood on the floor, a landmark in the distance. In a sci-fi game, it could be cables, licking a computer in the current room to a generator in some other room. Sometimes, signposting relies on players having a bit of common sense to interpret the context. If you go to the front of a plane, you know you'll probably find a cockpit without having to read any signs. If you're trying to infiltrate a castle to steal some important documents, you can probably guess that the Lord's Chambers are likely to be in the central building, not in the guard towers on the perimeter. When it comes to signposting, more is more. You can pretty much never have too much foreshadowing when you are asking players to make decisions. So, FPS maps can teach us a lot about how to make a map that's going to lead to fun combat encounters. Now, let's make one. This is a map you can find in the video description. It's the ruins of what once used to be a luxurious spa resort. It should work for all kinds of campaigns, from exploring ruins in a fantasy game to exploring ruins in a zombie apocalypse campaign to exploring ruins in a Fallout style campaign. You get the gist of it. It's a two and a half story building with only one room at the top level and an underground cellar. There's a lot of entry points. You've got holes in the roof that maybe your players might accidentally fall into during a rooftop chase. You've got secret underground passages that maybe you could say were used for smuggling some illegal substances. Or maybe they were just there so the wealthy customers wouldn't be seen entering this establishment. The building is divided into customer-facing areas on one side, and utility rooms meant for the staff on the other side, each with their own corridors so the customers don't have to mix with the staff. On the customer-facing side, you've got a fancy entrance hall, a changing room, a public bath slash maybe swimming pool, and then above that you have a cozy little piano lounge, and then some private bathrooms and massage rooms. As for the staff, they have a laundry and their own separate changing room, a break room, a bunch of storage areas, and then at the top of the building there's the personal chambers of the owner of the place. But let's go back to the theme of this video. The different types of connections between the rooms. And I counted at least a dozen different types of connections within this building. First you've got a bunch of doors, but you'll notice a lot of these doors are already open. Not just unlocked, but open. Open doors don't restrict movement, but they do restrict visibility. So for example, in this corridor, it's pretty much impossible to see what's on the other side. This is intended to promote melee type characters. But then you've also got a bunch of doors that are closed. I'll leave it up to you whether those are locked, unlocked, or maybe they're the kinds of doors that can only open from one side, typically the staff side. Then, just like in Rainbow Six Siege, I made sure to include a few walls that were clearly destructible. At the table, it's possible your players might realize they can poke holes in them to look into another room. Or maybe your players won't realize those walls are breakable, until a horde of zombies bursts out from it. There's a bunch of debris everywhere, which in D&D terms would be considered difficult terrain, meaning a good spot to use as cover for player characters, maybe enemies, who prefer ranged attacks. Then the pool itself provides fun elevation changes. Maybe you can have some zombies down there trying to grab people's ankles and drag them down into the pool. Or a nice little feast. The entire basement is flooded to about waist deep, which means you make splashing noises whenever you move, which could attract some unwanted attention from nearby rooms. But of course you could play the floor is lava, by only walking on objects that are above the water like those vanity tables, if you want to stay silent, and dry, and not too smelly. Then let's talk about verticality. There's a couple of holes in the floor or ceiling of each level. In the pool you have a hole that leads down to the basement. In my home game I had a decanter of endless water in the pool and it poured a continuous stream of water down into the basement, explaining what that basement was flooded. But you could also have it the other way. Maybe an otiog burst into the basement from the nearby sewers and it can fit its tentacles through the hole from the basement up into the pool. 
you've also got a hole in one of the message rooms above that leads down to the pool. In my home game, I had a couple of zombies stashed up there, and when my players made some noise, they fell down into the pool. We've also got two sets of stairs, one on the customer side and one on the staff side. The ones on the staff side reach all the way down to the basement, but the staircase leading to the upper floor is broken. A very agile player character might still be able to climb up, but it will be difficult. It will be much easier, though, for an enemy zombie who heard some noises to fall down those broken stairs. On the customer side, you have twin spiral staircases leading from the entrance hall up into the piano lounge. So maybe the player characters will retreat up there and use the high ground to fire ranged attacks at their enemies at the bottom. This is a pretty small map, and yet you can see that by keeping in mind the idea of adding interesting connections between different rooms, you can very easily create opportunities for a lot of tactics and fun gameplay. Even if, like in my home game, the enemies are just some boring zombies. That's it for today's video. Hopefully you learned a few tricks and got inspired to make some fun maps for your players. This is my first video, so tell me, what do you think of this format? What should I keep? What should I change? Or maybe you can just tell me what your favorite FPS map is and why it's your favorite. If you want to make sure you don't miss my next video, make sure to subscribe and maybe you can join my Discord server so we can have a chat about tabletop game design. Till next time, have a good one.